active and it becomes, the, the words here become real in us. They become expressions of who we are. So this life of power is possible, but this life of power that's possible is only possible and can only become a reality as we fall in love with and dedicate ourselves to the word of God. As we think about our vision going forward as a church, the, the centerpiece, the irretrievable, irrevocable, immovable centerpiece of where we're headed is the word of God. Darren Conley's hosting a Sunday school class. And it's not because we want to showcase Darren Conley, for crying out loud. It's because we and Darren want to showcase God's word and find and discover new ways of imparting God's word into the lives of people. The men are, me the, the men are meeting every other Wednesday for a Bible study. And it's not so we can just get together and hang out. It's because we want to find ways of imparting God's word into the lives of men. And so too are the women meeting for the same purpose. Soon, Barbara Carter is going to be challenging you specifically to take up this cause, this cause of, of embracing the Word of God as your, as your source and your guide and your authority in life by taking a 100-day Bible challenge. It's going to be exciting, and I hope that as, as Barbara corners you in the next couple of weeks, and she will, that, that you'll respond affirmatively, say, yes, I need this, I desire this, I want this power. I want the life that is here. Likewise, the man who delights in the law of the Lord and walks in his way is compared in the Bible to a tree planted by streams of water. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That the man who delights in the law of the Lord, in the way of the Lord, in the will of the Lord, in the heart of the Lord, and walks in his way is, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit and season. And so indeed, this word of God forms us, changes us, hones us to the very image of our creator as we bear fruit. That brings us to this fruit. What is that fruit? Scripture tells us through Paul's inspired words in Galatians chapter 5 as he speaks to believers saying, hey, believers, guess what? As you follow Christ, something's going to happen in you. You're beginning to take on some characteristics. You're going to begin to look a certain way. And the, that, that certain way is des described in nine particular virtues. And why this is no means an exhaustive list of the characteristics that will that will, will, will come to make us distinct. These are the nine virtues which God looks to to say these, these are those virtues, these are those characteristics which particularly demonstrate that you are submitting to and learning to live by the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Self-control. Funny. Interesting word. I know last week as Larry preached on Gentleness, that, that too is an interesting word, isn't it? Because it doesn't really mean what it appears to mean on the surface of things. That we forget that the, the very idea of gentleness or meekness conveys with it great power, but power under control. And so as we take up and, and, and look at self-control today, let's be very careful that we leave here understanding what God means when he says, this is you, by the influence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you. Self-control comes from the Greek word enkrateia. Jack can correct me if I've pronounced that wrong. This word refers on its face to the mastery over one's desires and passions. And although in Corinthians, Paul uses this expression in a context related to the control of sexual impulses and desires, it, it is certainly not restrained in this, in this context to that, although it certainly includes that. But here it has a broader application. 
this idea of self-control as a Christian virtue, virtue is indeed important for us. But self-control, biblical self-control, is not quite what you think. I've given you the, the, the bare definition, the mastery over one's desires and passions, and right away you're thinking, okay, we knew it was coming. You told us at the beginning that each of these, the fruit of the Spirit are things that God's doing in you, and then he gets to the last one, and he says, this one's on you, self-control. God's in charge of the other eight, but self-control, this is where you, in your willpower, in your white-knuckle approach to faith, comes and kicks in. And, you think, and that's where I'm going to fall flat on my face. The good news is that's not what God intends. That's not what God purposes in you in self-control, in biblical self-control. I think that, that as we think about what God desires from us in his self-control, a good way to, to approach that, at least initially, is to reverse the order of it. You see, because what the Scripture is talking about here is the control of self. Not your self's control over self, but the control of self. If you have an exterminator come over to your house to do pest control, does that mean that he's putting pests in control of your home? No, he's coming to control pests, right? When police officers go into a riotous crowd and exercise crowd control, does that suggest that they're putting the crowd in charge? No, they're exercising control over the crowd. And self-control, biblically played out in our lives, looks just like that. It becomes a control over self. And it's so appropriate, I think, that, and, I, and we can assume no accident that, that Paul lists it last in this list. In the same way, it seemed clear that Paul listed love first among the virtues to, to highlight this, this idea that when we, when we get past love, that love stays with the rest and sort of looks forward over the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. This idea of self-control, I think, is appropriate to say that sort of looks back over where we've been. And is, the, and is that virtue that asks the question, hey, who's in charge of your life? Who's in control of who you're becoming? And the answer, increasingly, and those of us who have been set apart and called out as Jesus' loved ones and sons and daughters of God, is God. I can't think of a better picture of biblical self-control than Jesus himself. Turn with, the, with me to Mark chapter 14. Verse 32. Jesus has been with his disciples at the Lord's Supper and had confronted Peter and predicted Peter's denial of him. And he's now with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before his arrest. And at verse 32, we enter the story. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to, to be deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus is not a stoic savior, okay? I think that we sometimes imagine that, that, that Jesus wasn't a savior who said, well, this is just the way it's going to go, and no big deal, and I'm just going to walk right through it just casually and with an air of resignation. No, Jesus was, at the same time that he was fully God, fully man. And this plan of the Father that would lead him to a cross where he would be nailed on it and die didn't sound good to him at all. He was greatly distressed about what was coming. And out of that distress and trouble, he cries in verse 34, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. This is self-control. It's a decision that Jesus is deliberately and specifically making and carrying out to submit his own will before the will of his Father in heaven. That's self-control. That's what God calls and desires to see in each of us. Not that we would somehow figure out a way to ratchet up our own iron will and live out some life out of that power that's ours, but rather self-control is that very part of your will that surrenders to the plan and to the direction and to the counsel and to the character and heart of God. To surrender. Today, tomorrow, and the day after that, your body is going to get out of bed, stand up, and commence doing things. Now, I want you to sort of, you can, I'm inviting you to have a kind of an out-of-body experience. Some of you have had those in other contexts, and that's not what I mean here. But a little bit of an out-of-body experience. So it's sort of imagine yourself stepping out of your body, and your, but your body keeps doing the things it's going to do, right? And tomorrow... And the day after and all the days after that, it's going to, until you die, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wake up, it's going to get out of bed, and it's going to commence doing things. It's going to go places, it's going to walk around, it's going to sit, it's going to stand, it's going to eat, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to activities, all kinds of them. Today and tomorrow and the day after that and all the days after that, your mind is going to consider things, form opinions, react to stimuli, harbor attitudes, good or bad, conjure up men, memories, imagine the future. It's going to be also involved in all kinds of mental activity. Tomorrow, your mouth will open repeatedly and words are going to come out. And sometimes stuff's going to go in as you feed yourself. Today, Tomorrow and the day after that, you are going to live. You're going to live in a particular, observable way. These are the facts, right? All of us. You're going to be able to observe our bodies and our mouths and, and to some extent even our minds as we live in a particular way. And close observation of any of us would suggest that we will be headed in a specific direction. This is a picture of self. That, that you who gets out of bed and does things and says things and feels things and forms opinions and lives out life is self. And really, the, the question of your today and tomorrow and the rest of your life, a fundamental, central question that gets to the heart of who you are and where you're going is this. Who's in charge of that body and that mind and that mouth that gets up and lives? Who's in charge? And there's really only two answers. In fact, the, the two answers are exactly what sets Paul up in this very passage. It's either going to be your flesh, which is influenced by and governed by, in so many ways, the sin nature that you died to. Or will you be governed by the Holy Spirit of God? Because that's God's desire. Let me be in charge. When I was in college and in law school as part of Campus Crusade, and one of the illustrations that we, that we used, Jack and I talked about this yesterday, was as we were sharing the gospel, was to, there was a picture of a seat. And on that seat, on that chair, on the seat of the chair was an S that meant self. 
And then down at the foot of that was a, was a cross that represented Christ. And then we shared how Scripture informed us and taught us that God didn't just, that Jesus didn't just come to die to, to be our Savior, but also to be the Lord of our lives. Because He has a plan for us, a beautiful plan, an adventure with destiny and power and all of it. But that only begins to happen as we, as we consciously take ourself off the seat of the throne of our life and yield that to Jesus. And that becomes for us the very picture of self-control. So meditate on that question. Who's going to be in charge? We, we sort of end with the question we started with. I asked who has been in charge? Who's going to be? And, and while I don't suggest that you do this because I want to make you feel guilty, I'll give you a little test, a little barometer. If you're curious, hey, how do I do on that first answer? Who's been in charge? Let me ask you this. For the last eight weeks, we've been describing eight words that are as important to you as any eight words in the English language. I mean, they're not alone, but of enormous consequence. Because there are eight virtues that God says are going to come alive in you and become real in you if indeed you are a child of his, if indeed you are in Christ. And so those words mean something. We want to know what they mean, and we want to get there. We want to begin to, to, to labor with our life and to self-reflect and examine and pray and yield to God and say, God, give me peace. Give me patience. Give me peacefulness. Give me faithfulness. And so my question to you is, over the last eight weeks, how much have you interacted with those questions, with those virtues, with those words? Have you come here on Sunday mornings and heard me and, and, and Larry describe biblically these virtues and encourage and exhort you to be pursuing them and sort of leave with this attitude? Man, that's, that's good stuff. I'll take it under advisement. Really, you know, it, it kind of, right? Yeah, I'll take that under advisement. I'm, I'm, yeah. And then Tuesday, hey, what did you guys talk about at church Sunday? I'm not real sure. Right? I mean, that's funny, but it's, uh, I mean, I'm the pastor, and that happens to me. What would you preach on? I don't remember. That's a little barometer for us. You know, if that's the extent to which we've been wrestling with these questions, we need to leave here today saying, God, I'm, in, I'm, I'm really way too in control here because I've reduced you to a counselor whose advice I'll take into consideration. That's not yielding control to the God of the universe who desires to lead you or me. Let's pray. Lord, We're so glad to know that as we approach your word today, that this self-control that you purpose and desire to see in us doesn't mean that somehow, in some way, that we are supposed to carry out this mission of faith journey that we're on under our own power. Lord, we, we understand, too, that, that you've given us a will, and that that person that gets out of bed tomorrow and begins to live life is in me is you're going to hold me accountable for that i'm responsible for the life that that i choose father help us each of us to choose surrender and submission to your will that we may model christ in this lord knowing that that even when things are difficult or especially when things are difficult or when, when the faith journey that we know you're calling us to seems uncomfortable or inconvenient, that we would be reminded of Christ and his submission to your will, Father, and do likewise, that we may come under the influence of self-control by your very Holy Spirit to direct and to grow and to prompt and to lead us all. Lord, have your way in us. In Jesus' name. All right. Um, kids, if you, Nikki, you better come up here because some of the little kids won't come if I'm standing here by myself. Um,
Nikki and I are going to invite uh, any of the children, and uh, parents, this is kind of where you come in. We're going to take any of the children who'd like to, who, who you think aren't yet ready to, to take communion. Uh, we're, we're glad to take them, and we're going to kind of have a special time just with them and maybe even uh, and definitely explain kind of what's going on in here just to kind of let them know and give them a taste about, about what we hope they're soon able to join us in doing. And so as Nikki and I leave, kids, why don't you, parents, if you want to send your kids up now, and parents, if you need to come, come along, and then maybe you can come back. Thanks. John, it's all yours. Thank you. Chad, could you help me bring the table up? Hi, guys. Come on. Come on. Hear the little feet running out. Thank you, Doug, for your message, for God's word. And I couldn't help but think as Doug was talking about God's word and our dependency and our need to rely upon God's word, to know God's word, to feast upon God's word. And as I was thinking about communion today and thinking about these last eight or so messages on the fruit of the Spirit. And each time Doug or Larry preached, the preface and really the first message that Doug gave was about believers who know Jesus Christ, who belong to him, have something, have someone, and that is the Spirit of God. For all of us who have come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in us. We receive the life of God in us. And as Larry and Doug have preached about fruit and the bearing of fruit in our lives, it always goes back to the reality that the Spirit of God indwells us. And it's his fruit that is borne out in our lives. And Larry, I think it was last week, was talking about John 15 in regards to our abiding in Christ. For apart from Christ, we can do no good thing. We can't live out or manifest the life of Christ that is in us. And as Doug was just talking about our need for depending upon God's word, I couldn't help but think about what a beautiful picture the Lord's Supper is to us as his church. I'd like to read from John chapter 6, a few verses. John chapter 6 verse 35 Jesus said to them I am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall never or not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst verse 51 I am the living bread that came down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as the Father's ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And then in verse 63, as the disciples questioned and wondered, what does this mean? How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The Lord's Supper is just that. 
a beautiful picture and symbol to us as church. It's another gift from God, such as his word is, that we see something represented here. The bread and the wine is a picture of Jesus' life given for us. And he calls us as his children to partake of him. That as we celebrate this communion, we remember who Jesus is and what he's done. And as his church, we come together as a body and remember what he's done at the cross. He died in our place. He rose again from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And as we gather here, I think that this meal is a unique meal, a set-apart time where Christ meets with us in a unique and a special way. His spirit is our food. The bread and the cup represent Jesus' life. I can't express or manifest that fruit of the spirit apart from his spirit in me and my daily dependence, my daily feeding upon him. So I think it's a beautiful picture as we celebrate together the partaking of his life for us to live each day. Chad, I'm going to ask if you would pray over the bread in the moment, but I'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Jesus or where Paul is saying for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you I'm going to ask if Larry and Don Don if Larry and Don could come up and help distribute the bread Chad? Again, in John 6, verse 35, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Let's pray. Dear Father, we, we do come to you, and we are hungry. And we thank you that, as you have declared, uh, that you, you are our bread you are our life and because of that that we can trust and believe uh, that uh, we know you personally Father we pray for this bread now we pray that as it's passed around that you would continue uh, to speak to us that you would continue to speak to our hearts and that we would continue uh, in love uh, to speak to you Father, we love you dearly. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.
Thank you for playing through, John. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the body of Christ given for us that we might share in his life and worship him well. Amen. Don, can I ask if you would pray over the cup? Father, we thank you for this occasion when we can participate in the bread and the cup. And we're reminded that the Word of God says that Jesus Christ is our Passover. He shed his blood at the cruel cross that we might be saved, and it's by his blood. When God sees the blood on our life, that blood that lasts forever, that blood that cleanses from all sin, he passes over us. We are his, and he is ours. Cause us to understand this morning that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses and keeps on cleansing from all sin. And as we participate in this communion service, we want to really honor and glorify Jesus who paid it all. We love you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray in your name. Amen.
1 Corinthians 11:27 Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is a special time as we celebrate and I'd like us just to pause for a few moments to pray before we drink the cup. And as Don prayed, remembering what it cost Jesus Christ, what it cost God in laying down his own life for us. And as Doug was preaching about his willingness to lay down his life, he calls us to a life of discipleship, a life of taking up our cross and denying ourselves and following him. And yet he promises us life. He promises us rest. He promises something that we're just beginning to understand as believers. Eternal life is a gift from God that he gives us when we believe on Jesus Christ. And we begin to partake of that life and share in that life today, even now. God desires us for, to know him and to love him and to walk in his ways. And we can be thankful for this table that's set and for his word that is our food, that we, we might grow in the grace and knowledge of him. Again, Father, we thank you for the cup. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ and for the promises that we receive from you in celebrating this meal, this covenant meal, where your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, where we partake now of your life, which is true spiritual life, that we might live in communion and in fellowship with you and with each other as your church. In Jesus' name. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great afternoon. The Lord bless you and keep you.